Here in the heart of London's financial district, a statue honoring one of this country's heroes, a defender of Britain's past glories. Wellington, the man who defeated Napoleon. But look beyond and there's a defender of Britain's present. The old lady of Threadneedle Street, as she's called, the Bank of England. Inside, ornate marble columns, spectacular mosaic floors, even the door handles carry the weight of history. And who oversees all this? Here he comes now, Canadian Mark Carney, for the past two years, governor of the B of E, the first non-Brit in the bank's 321-year history. Carney is no ordinary central banker. He's being described as a financial rock star. They line up in tuxedos to hear him speak in the hallowed halls of Britain's upper class. When Carney left the Bank of Canada amidst rumours of a run for the Liberal leadership, some Brits wondered whether a foreigner should really be in the top bank job. If I had political ambitions, I would have pursued them. No one wonders now. Britain's economy has roared back leaving others well behind. He makes news here a lot. We showed you his post-Paris thoughts on climate change earlier this week. He's also made headlines cracking down on misconduct in the financial sector, which is where we focused in this excerpt from our chat this week in London. Well, Governor, first of all, thank you for uh, you know welcoming us into the Bank of England. I mean, was, yeah, I'm sure you're tired of hearing it, but it's a long way from Fort Smith. But it's a long way from, you know, Bank of Canada, the pink suits and the ornate halls. And I mean, did it take a while to get used to? Well, it's a different institution. Uh, part of the tradition here is a real tradition of intellectual leadership and, and innovation, as you have to have if you have a financial system of, of, of the scale that the UK does have. Uh, and so you can build on those traditions. And, and you know, what we've tried to do over the course of the last few years is to, is to modernize them and really uh, create a new type of uh, central bank that has a pretty broad range of powers, uh, but powers that need to work in concert. And that's, uh, that's been part of the fun, if I can put it that way. Let's talk about something that you said in June, and it's basically about behavior within the financial mm -hmm. sector uh, community. So l let me bore you with your words for, okay. for a second, because I, you know, I, think that I've, I find this remarkable, really, when, when you talk this way. Most troubling have been the numerous incidents of misconduct that exploited such informality, undercutting public trust and threatening systemic stability. Real markets are necessary for sustainable prosperity. Not markets that collapse when there's a shock from abroad. Not markets where transactions occur in chat rooms. Not markets where no one appears accountable for anything. Real markets are professional and open, not, not informal, informal and clubby. clubby. Participants in real markets compete on merit rather than collude online. Now, to me that sounds like, it almost sounds like a movie. It sounds like men and women in the back rooms cutting up the cash of, you know, of, of investors trying to make decisions based on you know, things that are going on that they're totally unaware of. Is that, does it really happen that way? Well, it's, that's not the way it normally happens, and it's certainly not the way it should happen, but it did happen in some cases, and that's totally unacceptable. Um, but what, what you had was a process that uh, you had some markets where the structure of the markets allowed people to collude online and collude in chat rooms effectively and fix the price. So there's a structural thing, which that's the easiest bit to change. You change how people, how those prices are actually set, and you reduce the opportunity for collusion. The bigger issue is an attitudinal issue, if I put it that way, which is that well, what are the codes that govern these markets, and who's responsible for administering those codes? Um, so what we've done in London is that we're in the process of changing the codes for these core markets in ways that go from fat you know, uh, binders of, of, of small rules to readily understandable uh, rules of the game for the people who are actually trading in these markets. And then we're making not just those individuals responsible for their, their actions, but their senior managers so that they bear the consequences if they haven't trained their people properly, if they're not monitoring them properly, they're not taking action. And all of this is hugely important because what we saw with misconduct, so-called misconduct in markets, is 
What's happened is there have been huge fines against the institutions, justifiably so, um, but relatively few consequences for the individuals. And we want to put individual accountability back in the center. But so the, I guess the, what I'm also getting yeah. at is, I mean, you worked in New York, you worked in Toronto, you're obviously in Ottawa, now in London, and in each of these cases in the past decade, you've seen varying degrees of different kinds of misconduct going on in the background yep. of private investors' movement of money. I mean, it seems like wherever you go, you're finding these kind of problems. <laughs> well, there are markets, um, I'm a huge believer in markets, but markets need structure. Markets just, you can't just leave the market to itself. Um, it has to have proper rules that govern behavior in the markets and the consequences for individuals and for institutions of going offside in those rules. And we all believe in real markets. In real markets, you don't have collusion. You don't cut side deals. You don't go in front of your client. Um, but you compete on merit. All right. I want to switch topics here for, for a second. And, and Canadians wouldn't uh, forgive me if I didn't ask you a couple of you know, directly Canada-related questions in terms of you. When I look around here yeah. and in the room we're in, the, the, the paintings on the wall are your immediate predecessors, all of whom seem to serve 10 years. I appreciate you serve at the discretion of the Prime Minister of the day, I guess. Her Majesty. Her Majesty, of course. Um, but do you have a, a, a personal plan in terms of how long you want to be here? Well, a couple of things. One, when they changed the responsibilities of the Bank of England in 2012, and it was one of the reasons why I came here, because we had a new institution, new powers. Um, they also changed the terms of uh, the governor, so my predecessors could serve multiple terms. I'm appointed for just one at a time, eight-year term. And so what I signaled is, um, you know, I would serve five years of that term uh, because that would be the most effective time for reforming the institution, in my judgment at the time, um, and also for me, uh, me personally as a, as a Canadian. But has your view changed on that at all? I, 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 I've not yet finished the first half of those five <laughs> years, Peter, so I'm <laughs> wildly <laughs> premature like to make your a judgment. your options open, I guess. Yeah. Let How me long are you going to be in your seat? <laughs> 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 not another five years, I can tell you that. Um, I flipped through the British media to see how <laughs> You're okay. observed, and and the and the way they it was talk. A, it about was a good you. day today. I wasn't in the. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you've had a good run. I mean, sure, there 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 have been some questions raised over over time, but for the most part, you get stuff like this: the 50-year-old charmer, the rock star governor of the Bank of England, known for his George Clooney looks, strikingly even white teeth, impeccably cut suits, either a far-sighted visionary or a dangerously deluded fool. <laughs> so there's a guy who's covering all his bases yeah. in that. But when you get the, that kind of, I mean, governors of the Bank of England, I don't imagine very often get those kind of descriptions made of them. Yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't, you know, the depictions, those, those types of depictions don't mean anything. I, mean, I think the, there is a very healthy press here um, a huge range of just newspaper outlets that uh, you know cover us with dedicated multiple people at each uh, uh, paper, plus all the um, online and uh, and TV media. So there's intense scrutiny of the bank, um, and that's that's healthy. So we have a even greater, if you will, responsibility to um, to answer to people and to explain what we're doing. But does that kind of description ever tempt you to do what? You were allegedly <laughs> tempted to do before you left Canada, which is go into the movies. Car, go into movies, <laughs> yeah. right? No, go into politics. Uh, I can't. No, no. The short answer: I am not influenced by those descriptions. Yeah. How about the possibility <laughs> of, of change at some point in your in your career? Uh, look, I mean, uh, you're younger. Uh, look what you've done already. I'm not as young as I was uh, <laughs> uh, with the rest of us. Um, look, I have an incredibly challenging, fulfilling um, job. Um, and we're really getting going here in terms of, I think, making a difference. I'm Canadian. I'm going to you know, come back to Canada, and I look forward to, um, uh, to that day and, and you know, uh, contributing in some way. But it's, it'll still be a while. It'll be another, hopefully another uh, Peter Mansbridge interview before, <laughs> before that happens. Governor, thanks very much for your time. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks.